Uh, if you have your Bible, Colossians 1, we're going to start into this series. It's going to go now through Thanksgiving, and we're just going to go verse by verse through this fabulous book of the Bible. The title of this series is Colossians, Christ over all. And as you get into the background of this text, you're going to realize why Christ over all is a significant message for us to hear and for us to understand today. Uh, The title of the message is, Where is Your Hope? You know, we live in a world where people place their hope in all sorts of different things, all different uh, types of people, all sorts of types of materialism. Uh, People have placed their hope in all sorts of things. And if you want to just pause and say, what could I have placed my hope in? Let me ask you this. Do you ever get upset about anything? Anyone ever get upset about anything? Okay, there's some of us who get upset and other people are just very even keeled. If you want to know where you place your hope, where you place your hope, uh, when you get upset, you need to step back and say, why am I upset? Is this the foundation of part of my faith? Am I believing in this? Am I trusting this thing uh, that, that has kind of consumed me? Now that I'm upset, why am I upset? Something has been taken away from me or a threat of something has been taken away from me. And the book of Colossians, in many ways, talks about hope. Not like, oh, please, I hope so, but more so this confident assurance of what God has said is actually true. What God has said is actually true. If you're following along in the bulletin, there's a, there's a, a way that you can just follow through. You can fill out blanks and things like that. If you're a type A person, you're going to love it. If I miss a blank and you're type A, you're going to hate it. I'm just going to tell you that right now. The main idea of this message today is theological clarity, theological clarity and prayerful charity are distinct marks of maturing Christians, are distinct marks of maturing Christians. You're going to see up on the screen a map, and some of you might have great vision, some of you might not have great vision at all, but in the very middle, you see this little white box, and it says Colossae. Colossae is this uh, city that at one time was very prominent back in the 5th century B.C., very prominent, was known for its high-end wool, most likely colored purple, which only uh, would be uh, hard to find, but only for royalty and for the rich, and it was one of these very established cities in the ancient world. It's located in modern-day Turkey, and, uh, and it is just, let me get my geography right, just east of Ephesus. And if you're familiar with Revelation, then it is close to the seven churches that are talked about in Revelation. So Colossae was, Colossae was this great city, and then around the time that Paul wrote this letter to the church in Colossae, um, something had happened. Its prominence had diminished, and they became very insignificant. These people were religiously influenced by worship of the Roman goddess Diana, humanistic Greek philosophy, a fascination with the invisible world, and somewhat influenced by legalistic legalistic Judaism, even though they were a predominantly Gentile people. To the early Christians of Colossae, they were embracing a Jesus plus belief system based on extra knowledge and extra doing. It's Jesus plus more knowledge or Jesus plus more doing. And as Solomon says in the book of Ecclesiastes, there's nothing new under the sun. There are many things that would be prevalent in a Colossae that would be prevalent in our day and age today, even within our country and within our state, and may I argue, even within us. We love to have the idea that that as Christians, that it's Jesus plus something that we can control instead of it's Jesus only. The good news of the message of Jesus Christ is Jesus only only. This is up on the screen. False teaching and harmful beliefs were prevalent when the Apostle Paul wrote Colossians. They included astrology, Gnosticism, and legalistic, legalistic Judaism. The idea of, a, of, a, of astro, astrology is the idea, that the way it was practiced back in that time was as if it was a clear night, they would look up at the stars, and, and depending on different formations of the stars or things that were going on there, either believed that those stars were the angels themselves that were looking down, or if there was something where maybe the clouds were covering the stars or something like that, perhaps they did something wrong that displeased uh, the spiritual world. They were fascinated with the invisible realm. 
They believe that there are all sorts of powers in this invisible realm that, that were kind of like dualism of, yeah, it's Jesus, it's good, it's God, and yet all of his evil were on the same exact plane uh, with God. And yet Paul is writing this letter for very specific reasons. He's writing this for them to know that Christ is Lord over creation, even the invisible realm. He emphasizes Christ's authority over all evil powers. They don't have any control on him. And Christians are united with the risen Christ, and therefore they share in the power and authority of Christ and Christ alone. Other themes that are going to come up in this book is that we as Christians ought to be fighting sin, pursuing holiness, and living lives that are distinctly Christian, especially in our household especially in our household. And so as we go through this book, there's going to be times you're like, man, that does not seem American. That does not seem to be the way that I want to live. And as we go through this letter, Paul is saying, as image bearers of God, you are pointing, you are pointing by how you live, you are pointing to the one who is God. And we ought to live distinctly different from the people around us, and in this case, the influences that were at war against this little church in Colossae. Paul's warning can be summed up in Colossians 2.8. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. Colossians, this little epistle uh, Paul wrote when he was most likely imprisoned around AD 60 uh, or 62. Uh, Colossians was written as an encouragement to stay clear of false teachers by pursuing Christ as the one who is supreme and the one who is sufficient. He is supreme. He is sufficient. Christ is, we aren't. Christ is, the angels aren't. Christ is, the evil powers aren't. Christ is, this, this idea of Gnosticism and knowing more, that is not good news. Jesus alone is good news. And Gnosticism was this kind of syncretistic, and I don't want to use all these big words, but this kind of this syncretistic type thing where all sorts of world beliefs were coming into this people group. And in Gnosticism, there was this idea that if we know more, we can penetrate different realms between us and heaven. And the more that we know, the more knowledge that we can take in, the more that we can break, literally, their thoughts, the seven different levels that are keeping the soul from going to heaven. So in their thinking, their, their syncret, uh, the, the syncretism that was there, in their thinking, they're thinking, yeah, 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 that's good news of Jesus, and yet I must know more so that I can guarantee that I will have eternity in heaven. But there were also the legalistic Jews that were like, you need to do more so that you're acceptable to God. How many of you were raised in a home where you just felt like you did not measure up to the standards of your parents, your teachers, your coach, your boss? Come on. Anybody? Some of you. Some of you were like, eh, any standard win. It was just fine. <laughs> There's something that's within us. It's like, I need to do better. I need to know more. I need to manage life on my terms. I need to have it all together. Therefore, I'm going to be accepted by others, and I'm going to be accepted by God. There's also a group of people that are like, I need to be in Bible study and Bible study and Bible study and Bible study. I need to know, 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 know more, K-N-O-W. I need to know more so that I can be pleasing and acceptable to others and to God. But Jesus rebuked those type of people, didn't he? The religious leaders of his day, he re rebuked them and said, no, 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 it's not about knowing more about God. It's knowing God. It's about knowing this Christ. Jesus prayed for that. Let's go through these verses one by one. Verse one, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. Verse one is talking about who is writing this book. Who is writing this letter? When Paul is writing this letter, he's saying, I have authority that was given to me, not by my own will, but by God's will. God called me, God placed me, God has emboldened me, God has saved me, and he has given me a position to speak to you. Paul did not know directly the people of Colossae, but he did know Epaphras um, through their interactions. And then Epaphras is, spent, is sending back this news and saying, hey, something is wrong with the church in Colossae. 
Their theology is off. Their beliefs are off. They're being inundated by all sorts of belief. And, and I believe that Paul wrote this saying, hey, it's from Timothy also because the people in Colossae would have known Timothy. Paul discipled Timothy. Colossae is also not a Jewish city. It is a Gentile city, which means that they felt like outsiders. They felt like they had to figure things out on their own. And what happens next in these coming verses, Paul lays out this beautiful theology and themes that as you look at it, some things will certainly pop off the page if you know anything about the Bible. And if you don't, Lord willing, we will uh, go through it together. Verse 2 and down. To the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. He's saying to those who have been set apart by God, to those who God has called into his family by his will, not according to their works, not according to what they're doing, and not according to their knowledge. They're saints. They're not looked at as sinners anymore. They're looked at as saints. And when the Bible is saying faithful brothers, it's included in their faithful brothers and sisters. In Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. Don't miss this. Paul's not saying grace and peace from me, but grace and peace from the only one who can actually give you grace and peace. God our Father. And then he goes into this thanksgiving and prayer. We always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you, since we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. And of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Just in those verses, what do you see? Do you see faith, hope, and love? Do you see it? Look down at the verses. In verse 4, faith. We have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. And the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope, that confident expectation laid up for you in heaven. Faith. Hope and love are right there. But in those verses as well, he's establishing a theology of the Trinity. We see in verse 3, he says, God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then we're going to see Christ in verse 4, faith in Jesus Christ. And then further down in verse 8, you're going to see love in the Spirit. The Godhead, the Trinity, is working on behalf of his own people for our good. Bringing about faith, this trust and reliance, especially under the threat of many false and dangerous influence. Love, active. There's active sacrifice one for another. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and love who? Your neighbor, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor. The natural response of true faith in Christ is putting the needs and desires of others before your own. If you're like, I'm not putting the needs of others in front of my own. I'm not being warm and generous towards them. I'm not sacrificing for, for them. Then we step back and say, am I really loving them? And then the, do we want to? Sometimes we don't want to. And yet God says we need to love each other and need to love God. But the source of that, the fuel of that is our hope. Moving on, halfway through verse 5. Of this, this hope, of this hope, you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, the good news, the good news of Jesus, which has come to you as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. Just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. Now, there's so many beautiful things that Paul is laying out here, so many rich doctrines of the faith that we should pay attention to. If we're Christians, then doctrine should matter. What we believe matters. It is not good enough, don't miss this, it is not good enough for say, well, I'm a church-going person, I must be okay. That's not good enough, because all of the things that we do aren't good enough before God. You can say, well, I'm a serving person, well, that's not good enough before God. I'm a generous person, that's not good enough before God. All of those things are meant to be a response to what God has done on our behalf, not an attempt to gain favor of God. We need to get that in order. 
We were saved because of Christ's work, Christ's righteousness, which he richly lavished on us. We are not saved by what we know. We are not saved by what we do. And Paul is laying this out there for us. Now, we do serve. We do participate. We do love. We do give in response to what God has done for us. If we get that out of order, we are legalistic moralists. But if we get that in right order, then the beauty of the love of God has washed us clean. It's what God has done on our behalf. His righteousness through the person of Jesus Christ makes us holy, not our works. Otherwise, we would boast. Paul's charge to the church then is this. Walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. His charge to the church is because of this rich theology, your response is walk in a manner that is worthy of the Lord. We're going to get to that verse in a second, but I want to highlight it first because when we get to the word walk, it means this, how you live, the pattern of your life, how you live, the pattern of your life, and your behaviors all kind of come together to say this is what it means to walk. This is what it means to live. This is how it means to respond. For those who have responded to the grace of Jesus Christ, how we live will look different than before. Does anybody remember the story of Saul in in Acts 9? He's going, he's this religious leader. He's going to persecute the church. He's going to torture them. A few chapters earlier, he had already given the green light for Stephen to be martyred, the first martyr of the faith. Saul thought that he was doing the right thing. He thought that he was serving the Lord in the right ways. He was a legalist. He was a moralist. He did believe in the knowing and the knowing and the knowing, not like the Gnostics did, but like the Jewish leaders did. And when Saul is on the road to Damascus, he is blinded by a bright light. And everything from then changed. Jesus said to him, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why are you persecuting me? And we see this reflection of the change that happened in Saul's life. He becomes the greatest of the missionaries of the early church. He is establishing churches everywhere. Much of the New Testament comes from this very man who thought he was doing the right thing, and yet he was persecuting the very church of Christ. Now Paul is writing here and saying, no, 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 don't walk in that manner like I did. Walk in this manner, this new manner where we are image bearers of God. Look at verse 9. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom. Notice the placement of his will. First is spiritual. Notice that in the text. First is spiritual, that you may be filled with all spiritual wisdom. Then it's physical and understanding so that you can discern. We need to understand what's happening in the, phys- in the spiritual world, understand what Christ has done and is doing today, even right now. We must understand that so that we may respond with great wisdom and discernment in how we ought to live. Verse 10, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. If it's just you alone, you lay your head down on your pillow at night. You ever just stop and question, what is this life that I'm living? Who am I living for? What am I living for? Why does it feel like Groundhog Day, if you know that old movie? Set the alarm, go to sleep, some faster than others. The alarm goes off in the morning, you hit snooze seven times, you finally get out of bed, you get your food, you do your routine, some of you are like heavy coffee drinkers, you got to do that, you got to go through all of your feeds of social media, the news and all this other stuff, and then you go to work, or you go to school, or you go about your business, and Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, depending on your job, most of you, it looks the same every day. Some of you are like, I'm retired, and it's it's an adventure. And some of you who are retired are like, I'm working more than I did when I was actually working. And then you come home, or if you've been home, 
the meal's prepared. You're either preparing it or you're consuming it. You do your night activities. You watch the shows that you want to. You look at the bills that need to be paid or what's in the, 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 uh, the bank account or whatever that's there. You're, you're going through your routine, and then at the end of the night, you lay your head down. You're like, reset. Do it again. And do it again. And do it again. And do it again. And in that do it again type of culture, that do it again type mentality that so many of us have, here's what happens. Here's what happens to us. We get lulled into the rhythms and the routines of the world around us. And Paul is writing to the people of Colossae and saying, that's what's happening to you. You're just lolling in. I'll take a little bit of moralism. I'll take a little bit of mysticism. Hey, the stars can't hurt. The extra knowledge can't hurt. And we don't stop and reflect, how am I living? What am I living for? Who is influencing how I'm living. Most of us don't pause and reflect on that all that much. And Paul is saying here, pause and reflect on this. And Paul goes into this amazing prayer. In different ones of his letters, he in several of his letters, he has different prayers that are really vital for us to know. And he's praying for us. And he's going to go through this list here. I'm going to I'm going to read through the prayers that we'll go through. Uh, the, the, what's on the screen here. There's five items of prayer for Christians that he's going to go through. Let's look at verse uh, 10. So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing them. He's like, that's what I'm praying for you. And if you're fully pleasing to him, then your lives are going to bear fruit. Your lives are going to bear fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. He's saying, be filled, number one, be filled with the knowledge of God's will. Be filled with the knowledge of God's will. How do you know what God's will is? How do we know? God speaks in three distinct ways according to the Bible. He speaks according to his word. When we're reading his word, he's telling us his will. You can see on the discussion side of the, of the bulletin, there's all sorts of verses that are there that will talk about the Lord's will. We can discern his will by his word. What has he told us? We can discern his will in our prayers if we ask anything according to his will. He answers us. This is the hope that we have according to 1 John. We ask anything according to his will. He doesn't always respond to our prayers the way that we want to because oftentimes we're not praying according to his will. We want it our will. We want it our way. Paul is saying here, no, no, I'm praying that you're filled with the knowledge of God's will. So we know that we can, we know that God's will by his word, we know it in our prayers, and we know it in our community with other believers. We should be talking one with another. I'm learning about this God. What are you learning about God? What is he showing you? What is he teaching you? His word is truth. It's alive. It's active. If someone says something to me or you that we know is contrary to the word of God, we should not say, well, that's good for you. That's not loving. It's loving for us to say, where do you see that in the word of God? Because it's so easy for us to be distorted in our thinking. So many people go around and like, Jeremiah 29, 11 is my verse. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you. That's a great verse, isn't it? But it's not for us. It's a verse that's ripped out of a historical narrative in the Old Testament and becomes a great bathroom reading book. But it's not for us. They were in exile. They were having all sorts of harm, and they're saying, where is God? Where is God? And God says, oh, to my Israelite people who still remain, this is what I'm going to do for you. That verse isn't for us. It's for them. But we know a lot about the character of God by reading the story of how he's interacted with his people. So if someone comes up to you and says, hey, I'm discerning the will of God. Here's what I believe he's telling me. The healthy thing, the mature thing is to say, let's explore the Bible together. And the fact is, is so many professing Christians don't know what the Bible actually says that they, they stand back and say, I don't know that I can do that. I don't know the word enough. Instead of, I don't know the word enough, but let's look it up. We have all sorts of resources that are out there. And as a church, we want to grow your biblical literacy because that matters. That's what Paul is praying for, that we would be filled with the knowledge of his will. 
That's in verse 9. And then number two is bearing spiritual fruit in every good work. That's in verse 10, that you would bear fruit in every spiritual work. That number three, that you would increase in the knowledge of God himself. So not only his will, but you would increase in the knowledge of who God is. That's verse 10. And then look at what verse 11 says. So that you'd be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. For all endurance and patience with joy. That we'd be strengthened by God's power and might, not ours. We'd be strengthened with God's hope, God's security, God's ways, according to his wills, not ours. Many of us are like, no, 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 I just need to know more. I need to do more. That's what the church in Colossae was doing. And Paul is saying, don't be like that. Be strengthened in God's power by knowing the God of the scriptures. Be strengthened with God's power for endurance. Paul says, Paul says many times that there's a race to run. The Hebrews of, or the writer of Hebrews says that we are running this race. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, talks about there's a race that we're running, that we should run with endurance. And many people are like, no, 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 I've been running a long time. It's time for me to retire. I love this saying. I'm going to keep on saying until the day I die. If you're not dead, you're not done. If you're not dead, you're not done. Can we just say that together? If you're not dead, you're not done. There's an invitation that Paul has for us. Know this God and help others to know this God. Oh, no, 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 but I've been, I've been serving for years. I've taught Sunday school classes. I have, I have been a part of youth group and stuff like that. Do those children still need to know Jesus? Oh, that was so emphatic. Do those still, children still need to know Jesus? They do. They need to grow in the knowledge of who this Jesus is. Yes. And it's somebody else's job except for us to be a part of that. No. No. There's teenagers right now that are being inundated. Inundated by crazy beliefs and dangerous beliefs. At every turn, in the public school, in the private school, and in the home school. It is true. They need image bearers who are, are living out what Paul is praying for to come alongside them and say, hey, I know I'm an older man. I know I'm an older woman. And yet, hey, look to Jesus. Don't, don't live for yourself. How many people that they're retired or they're older and they look back and say, I wasted so many years pursuing my own dreams, pursuing my own things. How many people would say that? Many. And our, our children and teenagers need to know it's worth running, it's worth enduring, it's worth being patient, but be patient with joy. And it's not going to come from our power, it's going to come from his power. It's not by our might, but it's by his might. And look at verse 12. He goes on and says this, and this is so amazing, so powerful. Verse 12, 13, 14. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. What he's talking about in redemption is not this generic, hey, people were bought out of slavery. That's what redemption means. That's true. But what he's saying here is the knowledge of the people didn't get them out of slavery, and the good works of the people didn't get them out of slavery. Jesus is the one who got them out of slavery. Jesus is the one who is healing the sick. Jesus is the one who is mending the broken. Jesus is the one who is making all things new, and it's not by us. It's by his strength, and it's by his power. And so he's saying there, number five, continually give thanks to the Father who has qualified you, who has delivered you, and has forgiven you in the person of Jesus Christ. If we are united with Christ, it's his righteousness, not ours. He puts it in us. And to the church in Colossae, who were the Gentiles, who already felt like they were outsiders, he's saying to them, you are welcome into the family because of Christ and Christ alone. That's what he's saying. And here's the shame in all of this. And the reality of our day and age is this. There are so many of you, even in this room, who believe that the sin that you have committed is no match to the grace of God. 
the ways that you have fallen short in unholiness and unrighteousness. You think, well, yeah, I don't think God loves me. I don't think God cares for me. I don't think I can be good enough. I don't think I can know enough. I don't think that I can be forgiven. And Paul is declaring here emphatically, yes, you can, because his grace is more than enough for you. Followers of Jesus Christ, be filled with the knowledge of his will so that you can live in a manner that's pleasing to God because they know what matters to him. This knowledge comes from knowing God, the God of the Bible, and walking with him, not from special ritual that gets acceptance or from mystic revelation that gets any sort of enlightenment or forgiveness. No, only Jesus is the one who says, welcome into my kingdom and welcome into my family. So I want to ask this, where are you placing your hope? Trying to be a better person? trying to know more. In our day and age, this is, this is vital that you understand this. In our day and age, there's this belief that something inside of you is good enough. Something inside of you will make you whole. The hope, you just have to reach further down. You just have to reach further within and you'll, you'll find goodness. You'll find righteousness. You'll find some sort of self-actualization that is going to benefit you. And yet, it's not within us where we find our hope. It is outside of us where we find our hope. Because when we were walking the course of this world, and giving into the desires of our flesh, apart from God, living for the standards of the world around us, that God sent his son. He sent Christ. And there's many of you who have heard this before and never responded to it before. This is factual. I've been in ministry over 20 years. And there's so many who said, I've heard, I've heard, I've heard, I've heard. And yet it's just finally starting to click. Many times we don't hear because we just tune it out. Jesus emptied himself and he took on the form of man. And he lived a life that was only pleasing to the Father because none of us are, can live a life that's pleasing to the Father. And in the garden, right before he was turned over, before he was betrayed, he's sweating Father, is there any other way? He's not, Jesus is not scared of dying. But he knows that he's about to take the wrath of the Father for all of his children's sin on himself. Some of you don't know at this moment whether you're, you're a child of God or if you're not. And yet the invitation is come, come, come to me, and you will find grace. You will find peace. You will find rest. Come to me. Because Jesus did go to the cross. He did shed his blood as a payment for the wrath of the Father so that we would be declared saints and declared holy, that we would be welcomed into his family. And on the third day, he rose from the, gra- the, from the dead, from the grave, so that all who are children of God have the sh- assurance of new life. That the grave does not have the final answer. Jesus already is the final answer. And right now, he is at the right hand of the Father, seated in all authority. And even though this world seems like it is chaotically spinning out of control, it is groaning to be made new. And one day we'll see this Jesus face to face. The foundation of our hope Verses 5 and 6, it's up on the screen. You have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, that good news that I just shared, which has come to you as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing. The message of the gospel, this good news, is what Jesus has already done. It's not a message of go and do. It's what Jesus has already done. He knows you. He loves you. He proved his love through 
the gospel. And to the people of Colossae, a few years before Paul wrote this letter, there was an earthquake that hit. In many of the cities, the prominent cities around that area, they rebuilt. The Colossae didn't. So the foundation of their hope, the, Col- the Colossian people were an insignificant people in the ancient world. They were insignificant. Who cares about us? This Apostle Paul, he hasn't come visit us. But Epaphras was there. He most likely started the church. As insignificant people, God, how do we know that we are loved by you? Paul's letter reminds them of their significance due to the completed work of Christ. Here's how I want to close this message in the next 30 seconds is this. Would you take those verses that are there, those five items of prayer? You have them in the bulletin if you wrote them down, but they're in the verses right there. Be filled with the knowledge of God. Bear spiritual fruit in all good works. Increase in the knowledge of God. Be strengthened with God's power for endurance and patience with joy. And continually give thanks to the Father who has qualified, delivered, and forgiven you. Would you just pause for a second? And I want you to think about anybody in this room that you know. And if you're like, I don't really know anyone in this room that well, then I want you to think about someone outside of this room. And I want you to just spend the next 60 seconds. Pray those five items over them. If you're married, for a spouse. If you're a parent, for a child. For a friend, for a brother, for a sister. Would you pray this over them? Pray them. Pray these things. And then I'll close in prayer. We'll have the kids come back. And we'll end the service with a time of worship and celebration. Just be quiet before the Lord and pray those things. Our Father, we know that 60 or 90 seconds isn't long enough to adequately pray those things for one another. But God, I pray that you would mature us in how we come before you, that our prayers would not be some sort of uh, subconscious thoughts that we just have rattling around but they'd be intentional prayers like Paul modeled here for your children. And ask, Lord, that we would pray hope over one another, but hope that doesn't come from material things. It comes from you, the creator of all things. And ask, Lord, that we would declare the goodness of God in the land of the living so that Christ would be worshiped as he ought to be. And may it start with us in this place. In Jesus' name.